It's February 27th, 2011. At the Kodak Theater in Hollywood, California, the 83rd Academy Awards ceremony is being held. It may still be early on in the night, but tragedy is about to strike nonetheless. Reese Witherspoon comes on stage to give out the award for Best Actor in a Supporting Role. She reads the nominees. Christian Bale, The Fighter. John Hawks, Winter's Bone. Jeremy Renner, The Town. Mark Ruffalo, The Kids Are Alright. Jeffrey Rush, The King's Speech. The winner is announced. Christian Bale. Look at these people. Applauding obvious fraudulence as if nothing's wrong. I know what you're thinking right now because you're probably thinking the same thing that I am. But wait, this ceremony is honoring films released in 2010. Wasn't that the year Diary of a Wimpy Kid was eligible? Then surely the year's defining performance, Robert Capron's breathtaking turn as Rowley Jefferson, should have won or been nominated at the very least, right? Well, I've got bad news. He clearly didn't win, and he wasn't even nominated. We've seen lots of award season robberies over the years that deprive deserving artists from their due recognition, but never had there been such a disgrace as the Robert Capron snubbing of 2011. I'll be blunt here, the young man behind Rowley should have taken home the supporting actor hardware at the 2011 Oscars, and anyone who says different is sadly misinformed. Any questions surrounding his eligibility can be chalked up to smear campaigns from big Hollywood, aimed at keeping the traditional power structure in place. Simply put, the Best Supporting Actor award is given to an actor in recognition of outstanding work in a supporting role in any qualified feature film. While Diary of a Wimpy Kid was not entered into the 83rd Academy Awards, it still does meet all of the criteria to qualify to be entered. We all know that even if the film had been officially entered, the Academy would have still failed to recognize this performance. Robert Capron's portrayal of Rowley is so powerful that it puts those who were actually nominated to shame. Unfortunately, it looks as though what we have here is yet another classic case of ageism. It's that pesky Academy again and all their prejudices. Typical. It's really not that crazy of a take. There is precedent for children being nominated for and winning Academy Awards. Anna Paquin took one home in 1993 when she was 11, while Tatum O'Neill was only 10 when she won for Paper Moon in 1974. Capron's performance is certainly up there with those two, and I think most would agree he even surpasses them. Capron would have had a leg up on most of the competition too, as he was portraying a character that already had a wealth of backstory and lore in the source material that Robert could pull from for his interpretation. Sure, some of the actual nominees had played real people, but I would argue that no real human being has ever had the depth or layered persona that Raleigh Jefferson has. That he could not only pull off but absolutely crush a role with this much complexity is a testament to Capron's skill as a young actor. The stars must have been in perfect alignment because this film just so happened to be made at the beginning of the 2010s, a time when swag style was at an all-time peak. This allowed for Rowley's wardrobe to go extra hard with the plaid shorts and bright colors. Although he's freestyling a little bit here with the striped socks and sandals, the sense of early 2010s is mixed with more of a traditionally nerdy style to create a look unique to the character, and this allows his image to stick with the viewer for longer. This, coupled with the performance, creates a character that will be remembered for generations. Does anyone remember any of these goofballs? Exactly. This snub is a lot more visible with hindsight. If I were to break down Robert's performance here, the first thing I would go to is the speech. The way the lines are actually being delivered. There's no reference in the source material for Rowley's voice, so what we've got here is all Rob. He goes for a raspy yet still high pitched delivery. Yeah, you guys want to play with us? <laughs> it's spot on for the character. The vocal tone communicates enthusiasm while also still being perfect for this goober of a character. Physically and appearance wise, I mean, come on, what do you want me to say? Rob nails it. The kid went chameleon mode for this one, almost like he was able to absorb Rowley's essence from the page and literally become him on the screen. 
There has never once been an actor or actress in any given point in their career who was more perfect for a role than 2010 Robert Capron was for the role of Rowley Jefferson. Immaculate casting. Capron basically carries the movie acting-wise. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of performances I like here, including the dude who played Roderick, and I'm a sucker for a Steve Zahn part in any movie. My guy was Marvin in Daddy Daycare. The man deserves some respect. But even he can't keep up. Robert Capron eats these guys up when they share the scene. Take this scene with Roderick and Greg, for instance. Roderick enters, and Rowley immediately drops an atomic bomb on him. Wow, you're lucky. My mom doesn't let me play with makeup anymore. Roderick attempts a rebuttal, but there's no coming back from a Rowley bomb like that. The scene was written in a way to give Rowley this upper hand, but it's Capron's perfect, unaware delivery that really establishes him as the alpha actor in this scene. The others are following him from here as the scene continues. This portion is meant to show Roderick as the comedic focus, but that again is taken away by Rowley with just a single line. They cooked them, and they ate them. But they forgot to turn off the ovens, so the house burned down with everyone in it. How'd the trees get there? Comedic timing is just spot on here, and Capron's genuine fright really moves audiences. Are Rowley and Greg gonna get spooked here? I don't know, but Capron's acting makes me want to find out. I'm hooked. I'm invested. Support scenes? No. Rowley makes scenes. Fuck it. Nominate him for lead actor too. He probably would mop that category up. In terms of performances by child actors, this one is Hall of Fame caliber. This is up there with Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone or the little guy who played Gage in Pet Cemetery. Aw, little fellow was born for show business. Robert worked closely with director Tor Freudenthal to flesh out the intricacies of the part. Tor was a young and up-and-coming director at the time, and he was coming off of a run of short films, which he then followed up with Hotel for Dogs. So yeah, you could say he was on quite the roll at the time. He was the perfect man to accommodate Robert's talents as he built a friendly and open atmosphere on set. In other words, Tor provided the canvas on which Robert then painted his masterwork. The sheer difficulty of the part should not be underestimated. Those who were actually nominated did play complex roles, I'm not denying that, but those characters were nowhere near as hard to pull off as Rowley. I'm serious, the character of Rowley Jefferson is so rich with depth and complexity, to the point where not every actor can handle the task of bringing him to life. We saw concrete proof of this fact in 2017 when this kid stumbled his way through an ill-fated attempt at portraying the character in the recast Diary of a Wimpy Kid. The Long Haul. Not everybody can do Shakespeare, not everybody can do Kenny. It is what it is. As an added bonus on top of all of that, the character has a catchphrase. Everyone knows that the best fictional characters always have a killer line that they drop regularly. Hello, Newman. Hello, Newman. In Rowley's case, the catchphrase goes above and beyond, skyrocketing past memorable, straight into the category of instant meme. Zooey mama. Zooey mama. Three words that change the world. In terms of a catchphrase being synonymous with a character, this has to be top five in all of movie history. But that doesn't really matter anyway. The small details like the powerful catchphrase and the masterful dance number basically amount to Robert running up the score on the competition. His performance speaks for itself, and is Oscar-worthy on its own merit. To blatantly spell it out, let's compare Capron's work against some of the best moments from the nominated performances. Winner goes first, so we've got Christian Bale in The Fighter here. He's playing Dickie Eklund, the main character's half-brother, who also trains him to box. First off, I have to call out the Academy for not taking points off for the lack of originality. Burgess Meredith shut the boxing trainer game down as Mickey in Rocky. Anyone else is just a pretender. He was that good. Any boxing trainer performance will be compared to and judged against his. I don't make the rules, and apparently the Academy doesn't follow them. Capron, on the other hand, was the first of his kind. Never had there been a character like his. Even if we put that aside, let's take a look at the performance itself. Where'd you fucking park the car, boo boo? What was that? Where'd you fucking park the car, boo boo? One more time? Where'd you fucking park the car, boo boo? That's what I thought you said. 
I think I made my point here. What more do you need? Rally would never. Moving on. Jeffrey Rush in The King's Speech. Another portrayal of a real person, this time it's Lionel Logue, an Australian speech therapist who helps King George VI with his stammer. Here he is in the movie as portrayed by Jeffrey Rush. Well, that's a side of me we don't get to see all that often. The performance seems great, that is, until you see a picture of what this guy actually looked like. I'm supposed to buy that this is the same guy? No way. The Academy probably didn't know this, weird considering all of its members probably remember where they were when they saw the King's speech. Not the movie, but like, when it actually fucking happened in 1939. Anyway, Capron doesn't have this problem at all. If you were to look at this image and think what would the real world representation of this be, this image would be the first thing that pops into your head. Next. Looks like up next we got Hawkeye in the town. Uh, Hawkeye plays Hawkeye in this movie, and I gotta say, this bad boy should have won best visual effects. You guys see in this shit? But yeah, he's barely in the movie, so on that alone I think Capron has him beat. Supporting actor? Bro, you're like 36th on the cast list. I think best actor in a cameo or background appearance would be more your thing. Not trying to hate here, I can't wait to see the next Hawkeye movie, but he shouldn't have been nominated over Rob. Okay, we got John Hawks. Who? In Winter's Bone. He plays a meth addict named Teardrop. Alright, now we're talking, someone who played a character that might have a fighting chance against Capron. But then again, god damn it with the lack of originality. Seriously, a meth addict in 2010? Just like the Academy overlooked the Burgess Meredith Law, they also overlooked the then newly established Aaron Paul Law. Jesse Pinkman, you are not. Copy and paste the same shit I said about Christian Bale's character lacking originality. Moving on. Mark Ruffalo as Paul Hatfield in The Kids Are Alright. This is a good performance in a movie that really lends itself to actors showcasing their abilities. Mark Ruffalo takes his opportunity and runs with it, and if I'm being totally honest, he deserves his nomination. He wouldn't beat Capron though, because for as good as Ruffalo is, he doesn't ever hit a high like this. This is Capron's Oscar moment, the big breakup scene with Greg. How could you even say that? I'm a great friend. If you were a great friend, you would have told Mr. Winsky the truth. We see the disgust on Capron's face as he learns the truth that Greg has been keeping from him this whole time. That's immaculate physical acting right there. Even without dialogue, the actor is still communicating these powerful emotions. He then delivers a monologue in the same vein as Ellen Burstyn's in Requiem for a Dream. This is powerful stuff that would be just as at home at the Globe Theater as it is in the halls of Westmore Middle School. I've left no room for argument. Capron was flat out robbed. It says something about our society that we all just stood idly by while this blatant crime was committed on national television. I'd like to think that maybe this will inspire others to start speaking out about the injustice that occurred on that January night in 2010. An honorary award would be the least the Academy could do to make amends and maybe pull their name out of the mud. While there will always be snubs, it is the job of the people to demand justice, and demand justice for Robert Capron we shall. Zooey mama!